Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense, and today we continue our physiology playlist. This is video number 18. Let's talk about the sodium potassium ATPase pump. It is a primary act of transport. Kick the sodium out and bring the potassium in. As you know, sodium is more prevalent outside the cell in the ECF. However, potassium is more common inside the cell within the ICF. Have you ever wondered why? It is thanks to the sodium potassium pump. As you know, cell membrane transport is divided into passive diffusion and active transport. The passive transport or the diffusion does not need any ATP and it occurs along the electrochemical gradient. On the other hand, the active transport requires ATP and it's usually against the electrochemical gradient. If you talk about passive diffusion, it's not just one type. We have three subtypes, simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion, no ATP and no carrier. Osmosis is a special type of simple diffusion, specifically for water, and it's the same thing, no carrier, no ATP. It's like the used car salesman, no cash, no problem. Facilitated diffusion, however, requires a carrier, but it does not require ATP. Let's take a look at the beautiful active transport. You have carrier active transport and vesicular active transport. Carrier, we have primary active transport and secondary active transport. In the vesicular, we have endocytosis and exocytosis. Primary active transport requires ATP, takes place against the electrochemical gradient. We exert energy at the primary active transport site. Example is the sodium potassium ATPase, which is today's topic. On the other hand, secondary active transport, it needs ATP. It does not exert the energy by itself. It depends on the energy exerted and released at the primary active transport site. And that's why we call it secondary, because it's secondary to the primary. No duh. And here is the train analogy. First, this is the primary active transport. We exert the energy here. Secondary active transport, it requires energy, but the energy was exerted at the primary active transport site. Give me an example of primary active transport. We have the sodium potassium ATPase, we have the hydrogen ATPase, we have the calcium ATPase, and we have the hydrogen potassium ATPase, which happens to be in the kidney, also in the stomach, which is what we call the proton pump, targeted by the proton pump inhibitors such as the famous omeprazole. Secondary active transport, we have three types. Uniport, which means one molecule in one direction, such as calcium uniport. It could be symport, which means two molecules in one direction, such as sodium glucose symport or sodium glucose co-transport. Third, we have the antiport, two substances in two opposite directions, such as the sodium calcium antiport, aka sodium calcium exchanger, also known as sodium calcium counter transporter. And you see this antiport in the cardiac myocyte. What's the idea behind ATPase? ATPase is an enzyme to break down ATP into ADP and PI. What is PI? This is inorganic phosphate because we have two types of phosphate, organic and inorganic. I'll talk about that later in endocrinology. The energy is stored in that beautiful bond between the adenosine diphosphate and the third phosphate to make it adenosine triphosphate. Once you break that bond, you will release the stored energy. Magnificent. These are the types of primary active transport that you have. Sodium potassium in every single stinking cell. Calcium in the muscle. Hydrogen ATPase in the kidney. Hydrogen potassium ATPase, we have two of them. Some of them are in the kidney, some of them are in the stomach. We call them the proton pump. This is what secretes the hydrochloric acid in your stomach. And of course, when you secrete something acidic within, you have to secrete something basic without. It's called the alkaline tide of the blood. Sodium potassium ATPase, what's your story? First, I'm an ATPase, therefore I'm a primary active transport. I need ATP, the transport will happen against the gradient and the energy will be exerted at this location. I'm not dependent on anyone else but myself. And here's the deal. I'll push sodium out and I'll take potassium in. Specifically, three molecules of sodium out, two particles of potassium in. As you know, there is more protein inside the cell. I've told you before, anything that starts with P 
is more predominant inside the cell. You have protein, you have potassium, and you have phosphate. Also, you have magnesium because magnesium is in the supernova. If I have more proteins inside the cell, they will attract positive ions into the cell because the proteins are negative and the positive ions are uh, positive. No kidding. Water follows electrolytes, as you know. When electrolytes are flowing into the cell, water is going to flow into the cell. Oh, do this a lot of times and your cell will literally swell and explode until you die. Moreover, when water flows into the cell in humongous amount, there is less water in the extracellular fluid. So, I'll get extracellular fluid volume depletion. This will decrease the effective arterial blood volume, leading to decreased tissue perfusion, a condition that we call shock until you die. And that's why the sodium-potassium pump is crucial. Because without it, your cell will burst and your ECF will get depleted until you die. Functions of the sodium-potassium pump. It protects the cell from swelling. Yeah, by pumping sodium out and potassium in. But we pump more sodium out than we do potassium in. So the net result is more positive outside. And that's why the water tends to go outside now. So we protect the cell from exploding and we protect the extracellular fluid volume from being depleted. In other words, I will protect you from shock. It's thanks to the sodium-potassium pump, sodium is now more prevalent in the ECF, and potassium is more prevalent in the ICF. When I push sodium out, sodium is positive. Who's gonna follow sodium? Chloride. And chloride is negative, and that's why chloride is more prevalent outside the cell than inside the cell. When I push three sodiums out and two potassiums in, now I've pushed more positive out by the same token. It's as if I've pushed more negative in. This will increase the electronegativity inside the cell. And that's why the resting membrane potential was negative. If you remember the lectures about the action potential. Resting potential was negative, but depolarization was positive. This pump is primary, therefore it can provide energy for the secondary active transport, such as the sodium-calcium antiport, or the sodium-calcium exchanger, or the sodium-calcium counter-transport. Whenever you see these words, antiport, counter-transport, or exchanger, you know that we are talking about a secondary and not a primary active transport. But whenever you see the word ATPase, you know we're talking primary here. These are the consequences of the sodium-potassium pump. More sodium out, more potassium in, more positivity outside, more negativity inside. That's why the resting membrane potential is negative. And you have the secondary active transport dependent on the primary active. If you can master physiology, you will cruise through pharmacology like a sharp knife through warm butter. Mm. Sodium potassium AT base primary active, sodium out potassium in, and then the secondary active transport is the sodium calcium exchanger. When this pump pumps lots of sodium to the outside, sodium will accumulate here. And then sodium, oh, we have lots of positive here, repulsion force, get the sodium back into the cell and get the calcium out. Positive for positive to preserve electroneutrality. Now calcium is leaving the cell. In this case, this is the cardiac myocyte. Less calcium in the cell means less contraction, which is bad. Now let's give a drug that will increase cardiac contractility. Oh, how do you increase cardiac contractility? By increasing calcium inside the cardiac cell. How do you do it? By inhibiting the source, the primary. When you inhibit the primary, sodium will not be able to be pushed outside. Oh, okay. So sodium will not be able to go inside. Oh, in exchange for calcium. Ah, I see. So calcium will remain in the cell, increasing contractility. And that's why digoxin is used in congestive heart failure to boost the contraction of your cardiac myocyte. The greater the sodium-potassium ATPase inhibition, the stronger the positive inotropic effect, and therefore the stronger the cardiac contractility. Mmm, wisdom. And here's the first pharmacology tie. When you give digoxin, it inhibits primary active transport. Calcium will stay inside the cell. Calcium contraction. Pharmacology tie number two. What's the function of the primary sodium potassium ATPase? Sodium out, potassium in. Potassium in, okay. What if we inhibit the primary sodium potassium ATPase? Potassium will not go in, potassium will stay out. When the potassium is out, we call this hyperkalemia. 
Pharmacology tie number three. What if we, instead of inhibiting this pump, actually we stimulate this pump even more? Now sodium will get out even more, potassium will get into the cell even more. Less potassium in the blood, more potassium in the cell. When there is less potassium in the blood, we call this hypokalemia. And that's why we can use beta agonist to treat hyperkalemia because they cause hypokalemia. This is how you treat hyperkalemia. If you notice, beta agonists are here. They stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase, leading to potassium influx into the cell, and therefore there is less potassium in the blood, hashtag hypokalemia, to balance the hyperkalemia. Here are the drugs that will boost cardiac contractility. The first one is Mr. Dijoxin. How does it work? It inhibits primary sodium potassium ATPase, and therefore it will inhibit secondary Sodium calcium, it is calcium will not go out, calcium will stay in. Calcium, when it stays in, it goes to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, causing calcium induced calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, actin myosin, hashtag contraction. You can also increase cardiac contractility by stimulating the beta 1 receptor, which is GS coupled. This is G protein. What's the function of G proteins? To connect the receptor on the outside to the enzyme on the inside. Now ATP will become cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP will open the calcium, calcium will rush into the cardiac myocyte, calcium induced, calcium release, you know the rest of the story, contraction. We can also give drugs to inhibit the degradation of cyclic AMP, so cyclic AMP is gonna stay, opening the calcium channel, leading to calcium induced, calcium release, actin myosin contraction. All of these drugs can help you treat CHF because they boost cardiac contractility. However, calcium channel blockers are contraindicated in CHF because they block the calcium channel and therefore they block the entry of calcium into the cardiac myocyte and therefore they are anti-contractility. And when we have a patient with CHF, being anti-contractility is not in vogue. I freaking told you, if you master physiology, you'll cruise through pharmacology like a Gordon Ramsay knife through warm butter. On my website, I have 50 videos about cardiac pharmacology. Go to medicosisperfectionalis.com and download the videos today. They come with notes and cases. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to get my cardiac pharmacology course, my antibiotics course and my electrolytes course. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.